Hi, thanks for clicking on this video and uh, I hope you'll find it interesting. But here's a challenge. If you think I'm correct with what I'm saying in my video, I hope you'll reconsider what you've been doing if you're a healthcare provider or if you're a guideline writer, what you are recommending. However, I would be more than happy to hear from you if you have evidence showing my issues are invalid because it's not about being correct. It's just trying to use the best available evidence and make decisions. And I'll even go a step further. If someone shows me why what I'm saying is fundamentally incorrect, I will personally send them a nice bottle of wine and also redo my video. So hopefully that's a, a, a decent challenge. So leave comments or contact me via Twitter at MedMyths. Thanks. What I'd like to do with this presentation is to logically and mathematically show why measuring lipid levels more than once in a person's lifetime is pretty much a waste of time and, and obviously then also a, a waste of money. Many primary prevention cardiovascular guidelines have specific thresholds or percent reductions for LDL and other markers. And all of these sound very logical and they sound very evidence-based. But just because they sound like that doesn't mean there isn't a big problem. And what I want to do is work you through why there is a problem with all of this. To start off with, there are two reasons why cholesterol is measured. The first one is to use it in conjunction with other risk factors when you're trying to figure out what a person's cardiovascular risk is. And then obviously you'd fall, in theory, would follow it up on a regular basis to see if it actually changes over time. And then the other thing is to see if a specific treatment that you've made, whether medications or food or activity or whatever, has changed the person's cholesterol. So those are the two main reasons why cholesterol is typically measured. So let's address each one of these individually. And I'm sort of calling both a reason and a problem. So let's start off with, can we use these for assessing cardiovascular risk? Well, most cardiovascular guidelines now recommend estimating a person's cardiovascular risk rather than simply focusing on specific cardiovascular risk factor numbers. And that's great. Uh, I think we've too long focused on, you know, LDL and HDL and all that. We should really be looking at the cardiovascular risk factor numbers. So that's a good thing. But let's look at the math of cardiovascular disease estimates and how risk factor changes will actually impact a person's cardiovascular risk estimate over time, because that's the key thing to think about. So there are a number of cardiovascular risk calculators. This is one of the ones that, uh, uh, one of the ones I use uh, and, and recommend people using. And as with all of these risk calculators, we enter the age, the uh, sex, the blood pressure, and smoking history and cholesterol. And when we do that, we come up with a ballpark estimate of their 10-year chance of a heart attack or a stroke. So let's do that uh, with an intermediate risk person. So this is a 50-year-old male diabetic, non-smoker, systolic blood pressure 130, total cholesterol of about 4.4, and an HDL of 1. If we were to put that through the Framingham database, let's look at what risk factor changes, what the 10-year risk would be, and the actual benefit you might get out of a statin. And that's assuming that the statin produces a 25% relative reduction in cardiovascular endpoints, which is, I think, a reasonable number to use. So this person's baseline risk is about 15%. So that makes them what we would typically say is an intermediate risk person. Now, if their risk was 15% and we took about a quarter of that off with a statin, a roughly about a 4% benefit would be obtained in this individual if you were to give them a statin. Now let's look what happens as risk factor changes over time. So if nothing happened to this person, but the person got 10 years older, if we were to then re calculate their cardiovascular risk estimate, it would go from 15% uh, 10 years ago to now about 25%. And then a quarter off of that would be about a 6% absolute benefit from a statin. So there's a 10% increase in baseline risk as you increase about 10 years in age. Now, yearly increases in cholesterol are tricky to tease out, but they're roughly about 1% a year, although it does vary quite a, a bit with uh, patients. Even if we assume that the change per year is, let's say, 2%. What does that do to the estimate of, that, of this person's risk? Well, we've got 10 years in age, and then we have a 2% per year increase in total cholesterol and or HDL. And if we do that, you can see that that patient's 10-year cardiovascular risk is only increased by just about 1% over, over and above what you would have seen with the 10-year change, which is about a 10% difference. So you can see, even if you were able to measure this increase in total cholesterol, and we're going to talk a little bit later on about why that may not be possible, it doesn't fundamentally change anything with their estimate of their cardiovascular risk. And, and obviously, therefore, it doesn't actually change really much 
of their absolute benefit from a statin. Now, let's assume this person's total cholesterol went up, but HDL did not go up, which is actually not necessarily true. They typically both go up. But even if you just look at an increase in total cholesterol, you're still only looking at a difference of 25 to 30 percent uh, 10-year cardiovascular risk. And even then, that difference really would not make much of a difference to the benefit that you'd see with a statin. And that likely wouldn't impact whether or not a patient would take a statin. And so this is over 10 years. Let's say you were to measure a person's cholesterol annually. It's a complete waste of time because the cholesterol can't possibly change enough to have an impact on the 10-year risk. And certainly the same applies to five years and 10 years uh, based on the numbers that I'm showing you. And it's interesting, even, even with uh, blood pressures, which on average go up, uh, if you're looking at systolic blood pressure, they go up about a millimeter of mercury per year. Even then, that risk factor doesn't really change the actual 10-year estimated risk much in comparison to what just getting older does. So that was an intermediate risk person. Now, let's say we take a low risk person, 50-year-old female, non-smoker, systolic blood pressure, 130, total cholesterol, 4.5, and an HDL of 1 we see an even smaller difference. And so you can see a 10-year increase in age, their risk will go from 5% to about 8%. If you then incorporate uh, the potential for a change in cholesterol, it really only changes the risk estimate by about a half a percent. And again, the estimated absolute benefit from a statin really doesn't change much at all. So it doesn't help you to know whether or not the person's cholesterol has changed. What you really need to know is, has their age changed? There are other databases that can be used. Uh, the one that I just showed you was Framingham, but other people use the ACC, AHA, ASCVD risk calculators. And those, because they only look at heart attacks and strokes rather than other potential cardiovascular endpoints, the differences uh, or the impact that knowing a change in cholesterol has is even smaller. So if you're re-measuring cholesterol as a way to reassess overall risk, the key message is that increasing age is by far the biggest risk factor and accounts for at least 80 to 90% of the change in risk over time. So even if cholesterol increases a lot, let's say 2% a year over the next 10 years, the impact of that change on the estimated absolute cardiovascular risk is no more than about 1% to 3%. And the impact that additional risk has on the estimated 10-year absolute benefit from a statin is less than about a half a percent. So you can see that even if you were to measure it it wouldn't help a patient make a decision about whether or not to take a statin. So I think the bottom line is once you know a person's cholesterol, measuring it again five to 10 years later will not contribute to any treatment decisions because increasing age is the risk issue. So no matter what guidelines say, whether you should measure lipids annually, every five years or 10 years, this is the mathematical and the logical problem associated with doing that. It is all about age. Now, I'm sure a number of you are going to say, but in my practice, I've seen people with much bigger changes in cholesterol. And now we need to get into the issue of the imprecision of medical measurements. About three years ago, a colleague and I published an article in the BMJ talking about the imprecision of medical measurements. And when it comes to total cholesterol, LDL, and HDL, the single measurement imprecision is about plus or minus 10 to 20%. With that single measurement imprecision, that means if you are doing serial measurement changes, you need to see, roughly speaking, about a 20% or 30% difference in total cholesterol, LDL, or HDL to be sure that a change has occurred because of the biological and analytic variation that is seen with these measurements. So the second reason that we do cholesterol measurements is to assess a change in these uh, lipid values. This is also problem two. So many cardiovascular guidelines recommend measuring total cholesterol, LDL, and HDL one to two months after the start of treatment. And that intuitively sounds good. But let's now look at the math of changes in these cholesterol measurements. Because even though it sounds logical, there is still the potential of a big mathematical and logical problem. To wrap your heads around this, we first have to look at what is the percent change in LDL that occurs with statins. So we know if you give five milligrams of a statin, you get you know, roughly about 20 to 25% reduction in LDL cholesterol. And when you double the dose, you don't get double the effect. 
you get maybe another five or so percent reduction in cholesterol. And as you go up in dose, you can see even though you double it and then quadruple it and then go up to 80 milligrams, almost all of the effect is seen with much lower doses. So a 20 milligram dose on average will lower LDL about 30%. If you were to increase that dose to some of the higher doses that are recommended, you're going to get about an extra 10% decrease in LDL. But here's some sort of a comforting thoughts. If you give 20 milligram dose of either rosuvastatin or atorvastatin, about 85 to 90% of people get at least a 30% or more reduction in LDL. It's a fairly consistent effect. When you give a statin, LDL goes down. And increasing to 40 or 80 milligrams only gets another 5% of people past that sort of a 30% reduction. And here is just a, a sort of a depiction of the percent of LDL reduction you get with each dose. And you can see if, if 80 gave you 100% of the effect, you could just cut the dose in half, you still get 90% of the effect. You cut the dose in half again, you still get 80% of the effect and so on. And this is an important thing to realize. But now what we have to talk about is the average percent decrease in LDL from a statin versus the percent measurement variation for LDL in individual people. This is the key feature of why it's unnecessary to remeasure lipids. So let's look at the sort of LDL changes that you would see. So the, as I've mentioned before, an average change in LDL with a 10 to 20 milligram of a statin is about a 30% decrease. If you are increasing the statin dose up to the higher doses of 40 to 80, you might get another about 10%. If you were to add a zetamib, you might get another 15% decrease in a statin. And as I mentioned before, the average change per year in cholesterol is about 1%. So that's the, the average decreases in LDL from a statin. But now let's look at the cholesterol measurement variation. A single LDL measurement, as I mentioned, has an analytic plus biologic variation of about 10 to 20%. And if you were to do two serial LDL measurements, if a change in LDL seen is less than around 20 to 30%, we actually can't be confident a change in LDL has occurred. And even if we see a change in LDL of, uh, let's say, 30%, we can't be sure that it's exactly 30%. There's a lot of variation around that as well. So because of this inherent uh, variation, there are some really important math uh, cholesterol change messages. Given that biological and analytic variation, you could probably pick up a change in cholesterol that occurs when a statin is first added. So if you were to give 10 or 20 milligrams. But remember, almost everyone gets that. So is it really important to measure that? However, because of the size of the measurement variation, you actually can't pick up whether an individual person has had a 30% or a 40% ch change. That's too tight a number. And most importantly, you certainly cannot pick up an additional 10 to 15% change that you might see with a statin dose change or a zetamibe. And this measurement variation is not a fixable problem. It is just the reality of the world that we live in when we're looking at measuring lipid values in individual people. It is only a knowable problem. I'm sure some of you are saying, yep, yeah, but what about all the trials that show treatments change cholesterol numbers? Does that mean they're all invalid? Absolutely not. When you do multiple measurements in multiple people, these measurement variations balance out. So we can be comfortable knowing that on average, statins have this amount of an effect on lipids. And then one of the common questions I get around this is what if we do multiple measurements in a single person? Does that get rid of the problem? Well, even if you were to do four measurements before and four measurements afterwards and took the average of this, which nobody does, even if you were to do that, you only reduce the problem by about 50%. So the bottom line is the lipid numbers just don't add up. So despite what many lipid guidelines recommend about measuring lipids, when it comes to individual people, I believe that guideline writers can't argue with this simple math and measurement variation issue. And not a single one of the guidelines that I've mentioned talks about these issues. So what is the answer? Well, you tell me. Measuring cholesterol changes over time doesn't meaningfully impact cardiovascular disease risk estimates. The size of the measurement variation means most of the time you're really just picking up measurement noise. And because of all of that, I think measuring cholesterol levels more than once in a person's lifetime is pretty much a waste of time and money and generally just a source of annoyance and frustration.
So here's a reasonable primary prevention approach. And I, I think it uses the best available evidence while minimizing the time needed to treat because chasing after all these numbers takes a lot of time and also frustration. I think we need to guide people to reframe their focus towards cardiovascular disease risk numbers and away from surrogate marker numbers. I think at some adult age, whether it's 30 or 40, if you get a single measurement and then use that uh, with a risk calculator, along with all the other risk factors to make a ballpark estimate of a person's cardiovascular disease risk, that's a useful thing. Now, a number of guidelines recommend lipoprotein A and ApoB, and these add very little to risk estimations. And the really, I'm unaware of any risk calculators that allow input of those markers anyway. And I think regardless of cardiovascular disease risk, I think we should be encouraging physical activity in all our patients. Best evidence is about 30 to 60 minutes of moderate activity a day if you're looking at cardiovascular outcomes. We should recommend eating healthy food. And I think the best evidence is a Mediterranean type diet in moderation and avoid any diets that are low carb and low fat or low taste. And we have medications that likely reduce cardiovascular disease risk over five to 10 years by about 25% relatively. And then because we have those, we should discuss the benefits, harms, costs, and inconveniences of those. And if a lipid medication is chosen, don't worry about nor attempt to measure what happens to lipids. Explain that the biggest risk over time is age and that future lab surrogate marker measurements will not impact risk estimates in a clinically meaningful way. And so when people say, I'd like to you know, get an annual measurement of cholesterol or every five years or 10 years, it really doesn't provide any useful information. The problem is though, if you remeasure it, it will change it. But most of what you're seeing is just the measurement variation. So thanks for listening to all this and I hope you found it interesting. If you disagree with me or think I've made a mistake, please, in a kind way, let me know in the comments.